Kira Koto, Oraki Timoka, Ko Waitaki Te Awa, Ko Te Rapuai, Ko Waitaha, Ko Kati Mamoi, Ko Kaitahu Oko Iwi, Ko Moiraki Te Marai, Ko Vanessa Kurwal Takunga, Nami Hinui. Thank you to Ross and to the Drug Foundation for this awesome opportunity to have this korero and to engage in this. What I think is quite an adult discussion uh, about uh, where we're at uh, in this um, state of making an um, important decision about drug policy from here. Um, thanks to, to Nicole for uh, sharing the um, experiences in Australia, um, and particularly in regards to addressing methamphetamine, uh, and make a couple of comments about that as well. Um, I must admit to being a little bit intimidated uh, after following such a long line of uh, strong and inspiring speakers, uh, and I feel the pressure of uh, having to say something more intelligent than just ditto. <laughs> um, I'm a woman, uh, a mother, a sometimes academic, a psychologist, a manager, an advocate, a family member of a number of people who experience uh, significant um, problems with substance use and have seen the wrong side of the criminal justice system. None of us are one thing. And I really want to stress that we need to talk about how we can all contribute uh, to this solution uh, and with respect and how we all bring something to the table to make this work better. For too long, uh, our fragmented system in which we all operate uh, has created so many barriers to the effective use of the resources that we do have and forgetting the outcomes that actually we are all wanting uh, for people uh, and communities to get well. So I really just, I want to uh, say to us that we actually need to um, be working together rather than replicating that fragmentation here. I'm actually really proud to be part of a sector uh, and involved in a sector that values and involves the voice of consumers and peers uh, in key decisions, in co-design of services, in the commitment to uh, um, increasing the peer support workforce, um, and stress again the desire to uh, want to work together for appropriate solutions uh, for our various communities across the board in all um, various pathways um, for wellness and, um, and treatment. And to that end, I actually want to acknowledge uh, the enormous contribution of, let me say, the two and a half people that work on our behalf in the entire Ministry of Health. That's all we have. So when we talk about the people that are making these decisions, we're talking about two and a half people. That's all the ministry give to us. Um, and they really need our support. And so I really want to acknowledge particularly um, the the tireless advocacy uh, that Peter Kennelly has done on our behalf collectively, particularly from the treatment um, sector, um, but from the um, wider um, harm reduction sector as well. Uh, and you know, he has to front up when um, he gets turned down for funding applications, as he has done uh, from my service, uh, and I know from many of yours as well. And I also want to acknowledge, uh, despite uh, and well, rather, um, uh, including the comments that were made this morning uh, around the uh, police and justice services, um, but they have actually really stepped in to a space and a vacancy that the treatment services uh, have sometimes not been able to fill. They've tried some really innovative approaches to engage people into um, uh, thinking um, about uh, their drug use, um, to uh, trying to engage them into treatment, and they've actually felt the frustration as much as we have of not being able to meet, uh, you know, their own desires to see people get well as um, in the same way that we do. Um, there are a couple of things that I just want to comment on in reflection of both Nicole's um, presentation around methamphetamine specifically um, and others in general. And while I steadfastly agree uh, with reducing harm by removing the criminal convictions uh, for drug possession, et cetera, that we've all, um, for the very reasons we've all heard about um, throughout the last couple of days, and particularly this morning, 
Um, I would just reflect uh, on the challenge of locating this issue squarely in health um, and in a paradigm, shifting it just from one paradigm to um, a health paradigm, um, because it's not a panacea. People using drugs and those who are in recovery in all pathways um, experience stigma in many forms, uh, not just criminal justice, uh, and they will continue to do so unless we do something um, as, as a whole, including so, um, difficulty uh, accessing social housing uh, and the meth testing, which was um, <laughs> a huge misappropriation uh, of policy uh, information uh, to the detriment of many, many whānau. Uh, and thanks again to the Drug Foundation for making that really, um, calling them to task on that. Um, having to declare mental health conditions and addiction um, diagnoses on many forms uh, when you engage, including health insurance, et cetera. Um, drug testing in schools, I was actually contacted just earlier this week by a really concerned member of, of a community who, um, who um, was actually just letting me know that there were two 14-year-olds who had been drug tested uh, on their, at school on Monday uh, and told to sent home after a dipped, dipstick test, urine test. Uh, I just find that appalling in this day and age, frankly, um, and uh, at best it's incredibly misguided policy, at worst unlawful, uh, and so there are a whole he heap of things associated with this that, that we need to champion. And I guess this is for us, um, you know, a vehicle in which to, to start some of those conversations. And indeed, I'd have to say, in our very health system, um, people are often stigmatised um, because there is a pervasive and persistent um, perception that this um, uh, drug, problematic drug use uh, and addiction is a um, self-inflicted condition. So the systemic and public changes that are required are very broad uh, and it's a long game. Uh, in, that was mentioned yesterday, the changes uh, that are proposed here to meet our human rights obligations in order to provide access to health care for those who need it uh, in our currently under-resourced uh, health system. And I'd echo uh, Nicole's comments, it, our, exactly the, same, the story's exactly the same. It's echoed across the Tasman. Um, so we're not meeting those obligations already. So uh, we need to be uh, doing something about that. Uh, and in that respect, I'd really like to acknowledge the work of uh, groups like uh, the People Movement, um, and there are a couple of others that uh, we've become aware of who have really, again, stepped into that space where treatment access has just been um, invisible and uh, been very, very difficult for um, people affected by drug use, uh, and their families who are quite frankly um, really distressed uh, and you know really are impacting the, the wellness in their community. Um, in terms of the methamphetamine issues specifically, uh, as many of you will remember, back in 2009 we had the Prime Minister's uh, methamphetamine action plan. And one of the challenges I guess that we've learned um, in the last few years following that is that it's really nice when you have got the attention of the Prime Minister and, and um, because what that means is that all the departments involved in that actually have to um, report and so they're very keen to make sure they get some success. Um, but if there happens to be a change in Prime Minister, as we have had, or their attention gets diverted to something else, then all of the um, <laughs> attention disappears, uh, your funding dries up, and um, it doesn't matter how good your services were, as we have found with um, some of the uh, methamphetamine-specific initiatives, uh, the funding is just um, when we can't get it, that we can't, the programs can no longer exist. So although um, the, the stats will tell us, um, some of the stats I should say, uh, will tell us that the prevalence of methamphetamine use uh, has dropped, or at least that was the report 18 months ago, um, I'd have to say um, visiting communities around the country, um, you know, country, uh, communities are still very um, 
uh, are feeling the impact of methamphetamine, absolutely. So we certainly can't um, continue to ignore that uh, in the same way that we are, at what we have been. Um, we did certainly, in the, uh, from the 2009 report, we actually implemented a number of the, the um, features that uh, Nicole mentioned. Uh, we did fortunately avoid the whole uh, stigmatising national official campaigns like the Faces of Meth and those terrible ads that you guys had. Um, so that's a good thing. Uh, but we also, unfortunately, uh, neglected to invest heavily in letting people know where they could get <laughs> the help, where they could get the information. So there were lots of us furiously working to develop these really cool things, um, really innovative ideas, uh, but no one knew where to find it. Uh, no one knew where it was. Uh, and so if you were lucky, if you actually got in there, and let me tell you, they were always full. So. Um, we kind of got used to the idea that because people were coming in, they knew where we were. The reality is uh, that's something that we've, um, we've neglected to do. Uh, and we've certainly been advocating for ways to uh, make sure that access is uh, much more open and available uh, and some ideas to do that. Um, I'm just sorry, I'm just making my notes because I wrote furiously while Nicole was talking. Um, Yeah, in fact, the, the last report in which uh, I mentioned that the uh, prevalence actually got reduced, that was 18 months ago, December 2015. Uh, the only statistic uh, that actually increased in that report uh, was uh, around the prevalence of methamphetamine in the community, uh, was the difficulty people had in finding treatment. And so, you know, we really needed to take notice of that. Uh, we set up uh, innovative ideas, as I mentioned, including social detox services uh, as part of a range of um, interventions. Uh, but I found myself, um, with some dismay, I have to say, uh, when I tried to refer a family member into uh, that service uh, where they were living uh, about 18 months ago, um, that it, it had already um, lost the, uh, it had already been absorbed by the, um, uh, the traditional treatment centre um, uh, system. So it no longer retained what it was actually set up to, to do, which was the quick in, the, the stay for the uh, two weeks, and then um, out again. Um, it was really seen as a pathway where you had to, I mean, the whole idea of a social detox was that you go in there to detox and then get your assessment done there to decide if there's a problem that needs more attention, yeah? Uh, not that you need a comprehensive assessment before you get there. <laughs> kind of defeats the whole purpose. So. Um, so there's been, uh, um, what there has been is a lack of communication, not just with the public, but also with services to, um, to remind them what these uh, in, uh, innovations and these services were actually um, put there for. Um, oh, obviously, uh, as I mentioned, uh, just echoing the uh, similar funding um, breakdown here as in um, Australia, uh, sadly, um, and, in, and that's been commented on several times, the disparity. I mean, we've got a fantastic national drug policy which emphasises uh, the, um, the health components, but of course we all know that the reality is um, the money's where it's at and the money is still sitting in um, police and corrections to, to manage the situation that way. So um, it's all about the money. <laughs> uh, but at the end of the day, um, it, we can't do um, what we need to be able to do uh, and continue to develop services to meet the needs and to do what we know works. We know what works, um, but we're not able to do that or engage um, other services uh, because we just so uh, don't have the capacity to do that. Um, 
We do have uh, reports from admissions of two of our largest services in the last couple of years which show really clearly that, the, uh, that people are um, entering treatment uh, primarily for methamphetamine addiction as their um, primary drug, which is the first time that we've seen that shift. That's quite a significant shift for us um, from a treatment point of view. Um, obviously, uh, for the most part, that is um, polydrug use, but uh, methamphetamine being the primary, uh, primary drug for which they're seeking help. Uh, and previously, of course, it was um, alcohol and, and other substances. It's the first time that something else has overtaken alcohol in those statistics. Um, look, and I guess I'd just say collective um, funding for those initiatives, despite the National Party candidates' assertions that, uh, <laughs> again, that extra money has been put in, um, I'm looking around the room and I can't see anybody representing a service that's actually seen any benefit of that money at all, including me. Um, and in fact, many of you um, are doing over, well over and above, in fact, I'm sure all of you are, it's just some I don't know, um, uh, well over and above what we are contracted to do um, because we're desperate to actually try and meet the community need and still it's not happening. Um, and some of us, uh, like down the back, are actually doing it uh, you know, for for free and t for actually, um, you know, trying to uh, meet the the, um, the need that's actually in the community. So, in terms of that, um, I guess uh, for me, um, it while we while we think about it as a health issue, uh, it, it's actually about. I do want to make sure that we're talking about it uh, as um, it not just individual health but uh, Fano and family health uh, and community health. Um, it's wider than just addiction treatment in the traditional sense. It's about interventions. It's about um, wellness uh, and inclus inclusivity. Uh, and as Kylie mentioned, it's about identifying the why, why people are actually uh, seeking help and addressing that uh, properly. And, in a way that's actually going to make an impact on, on the community. Uh, Alison, so to, sorry, I just wanted to say about that, uh, that's going to involve cross-departmental funding. If we try to locate it just in health, and that's my, that's my anxiety, is that others will step back and go, great, <laughs> you pay for it. Um, that just can't happen, that's what happens now. And we fight for crumbs, um, and we just can't keep doing that for too much longer. The, treat, the Addiction Treatment Centre spends an enormous amount of time uh, simply um, tr advocating for, uh, or, or actually just getting um, uh, con bits of contracts from government departments and fighting each other for the crumbs. Um, it's just not sustainable. Uh, in the long term. Uh, and uh, so just to pick up on Alison's um, point yesterday in regards to that, uh, when we're looking to drug law reform, uh, and I have to say it's awesome to see so many people and colleagues uh, from the health services uh, across the spectrum uh, here today when we talk about drug reform. I think, Ross, if you'd called this meeting five years ago, you wouldn't, you'd had one little row of health people up the front. So it says a lot about how much we've actually become aware of the, um, of the importance of influencing policy uh, and how um, law and policy actually dictate how we collectively uh, think about, talk about, uh, and resource um, drug treatment, but also um, people who use drugs in the wider community as well. Uh, so it's important that we're, we're all here today and it's, um, it's awesome to see. Uh, however, I do want to just say that that does mean um, the learnings from our, our meth, <laughs> uh, the last couple of years in trying to address some of the issues around meth is that we do need very strong, in, in the same way with this too, uh, with drug law reform, very clear public health messages, including information uh, and 
uh, where to go for help, how to recognise if things are a problem, where to go for help and actually have the help available. Um, and it's a long game. So as Alison reflected, we've been doing this for over 30 years consistently for the tobacco industry. It's no good for us just doing a one-year blitz on methamphetamine or on, uh, on drug law reform and then expecting everyone to remember it. Uh, because it just doesn't happen that way. We just have to consistently reinforce those uh, those messages uh, and uh, and keep that information up to date. Um, I've been round up. Okay. And look, I won't take too much more of um, your time. Just in fact, um, that really sums it up. I mean, everybody has uh, has talked to those issues really uh, clearly. So I haven't got too much more to add. Uh, the only thing I do want to say is that um, the only good thing about inequality uh, is that we created it so we can fix it. Uh, so let's do that. Kia ora. Thank you both. Um, without, really, really, really briefly, I've got one burning question, and that is um, both of you criticised the public health messages that have been put out ill-advisedly by uh, governments, particularly the Australian government. What does a good public health message look like for meth? Can you, can you sum that up for me quickly? Yeah, I guess, well, what we know so I'm going to answer this in a convoluted way, but what we know doesn't work, scare messages, scare campaigns, um, things to frighten people. That um, ad was a mimic of one that was um, used in the US and the evaluation of that showed that it actually increased interest in using drugs. Um, and so, of course, we did it again, like seven years later, we decided that would be a good idea. So the things that um, we know are helpful, particularly for young people, to reduce drug use is um, sensible, clear, factual information about drugs. And we know that when people have the facts about drugs, they make good decisions, they make their own good decisions about whether they'll use or not and, with, and how safely they'll use. So 